Brad Chalmers, as is Dwyer. Works it wide for Latino, then tries to get on the end of the rebound instead. It is teed up for Sasha Question. The former Red Bulls captain with a goal to stun Red Bull Arena. Orlando without an away win for the best part of the year. Are ahead in New Jersey. Remarkable. And with that, <laughs> that incredible uh, compilation, I guess, of, of randomness, the, we begin the Orlando Soccer Show here today. Welcome in, everyone. My name's Austin David. Gavin Eubank is joining me. And yes, Orlando City did win a game in New Jersey against the New York Red Bulls. one nothing thanks to Sasha Kleschen. So let us begin. Gavin, first, are you okay? I am very okay. Like you said, Orlando City won. And for the first time in, oh, what has it been, like six months, we get to talk about a win? Well, I mean, I wasn't there when that, the last time you guys got to talk about a win, but it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been even longer than that, actually, since I've been able to talk about a win. It's been like a year. It's crazy. Well, the last time that Orlando City won a game was the last game of the season. Right, but... If the last remember, time they the, right the I last the last time they won an away game though was almost a good part of a year, yeah, and that is that is the big note right there, is that <laughs> it's been almost a year since they won an away game, and they beat the Red Bulls of all teams, a team that does not lose at home by the way, right? What's the, what's their record at home from from last season? Something something um, stupidly ridiculous, wasn't it? I know that they haven't lost. Their, this was their first loss at home since, like, July. Okay, so they were 14-2-1 last season at home. Yeah, that's about as, as much of a fortress as you can pretty much get in Major League Soccer at home. Yeah. 2017 was not that great of a year for them. Uh, but 2016, they were 13-2-2. Two two. So okay. it, it just goes to show you how good of a team they are at home to this point in the season they were only 1 and 0 so start them off good with their their first home loss mm-hmm. meanwhile orlando is looking for their first home win as they will be taking on dc united this weekend it's not going to get any easier for them obviously dc arguably one of the top 2 teams in the league if you're not willing to give them the top spot in the league 3 and 0 on the year all shutouts, seven oh uh seven goals scored, no goals conceded. It's not gonna be an easy one regardless of where this game's being played, which is obviously in Orlando, as you mentioned. Right. So last game they won five nothing against Real Salt Lake. Hat trick from Rain- Wayne Rooney, a uh goal from Lucas Rodriguez and Segura. I mean they've got a they got a great squad. Ariola's gonna be with the national team. I don't know if he plays in that game. Uh, you'll probably have Acosta and Brilliant, Joseph Mora. I mean, you can go down the list. They've got Ameriqua off the bench who hasn't really played yet. Zoltan Stieber. And then, of course, Bill Hamid in goal. It's it's a very well-built team compared to where they were just a few years ago. And again, it bears repeating because this is this is how MLS works. DC United was a laughing stock a few years ago. And now they're one of the better teams in MLS, if not one of the best. I mean, DC United was one of the worst teams in the league last year at the start of the season before they got Wayne Rooney, too. So, I mean, turnarounds happen can happen very quick. Um, I mean, a lot of it, obviously, to do with Wayne Rooney and the resurgence there and getting that new stadium. But, I mean, it all just came together. A lot of people were wondering if they would be able to keep it together this year. And so far, they have. Yeah, it almost it almost did not happen because that whole situation with Luciano Acosta going to PSG mm-hmm. and then actually not going to PSG and ended up coming back here. You were kind of wondering a little bit, maybe is there something going on? Is there some unrest? Is Acosta upset that he's not able to go to PSG and instead has to stay at DC United? But it seems to be all working out so far to this point, you know, in terms of results. So results, wins, that keeps players happy. And a 5 nothing win against a, a decent enough Real Salt Lake team uh, definitely 
gives you a bit of confidence going forward, especially into a game against Orlando uh, at a uh, an environment such as Orlando City Stadium. Um, is it fair to say, I mean, do you think, because it's very interesting, obviously the crowds have been pretty kind of not the best, and that's not to say they've been bad, but now the team's coming off a win. They've They've played well in three of their four games this year. You think we'll actually have a pretty good crowd on Sunday? I mean, it's a Sunday night game, so that kind of, I don't know if that helps or hurts it. I don't know if spring break's going on down there. I mean, it's all over the place in the Florida. It's kind of different everywhere. Yeah, spring break so. spring break for different colleges, I think, was last week. Mm-hmm. And, like, high school was the week. Or, no, two weeks ago was college, and I think last week was high school. I may be getting that wrong. It might be high school this week. I don't know. But... Like you said, it's it's Sunday night, six thirty, so it's fairly early. Should be able to get yeah, there by get out the, by eight thirty, nine o'clock, right? And so I I think they would be a good crowd. I would hope it'd be a good crowd. Yeah, I mean, there's there's optimism. I think obviously the three one loss against Montreal doesn't put a lot of optimism. It's kind of like leaving that bad taste in your mouth, like the the recency bias, I guess, so to speak. But coming off a win against a very good at least what we think is a very good Red Bulls team should be enough to kind of get more people out to the stadium thinking like you know this is actually probably worth paying attention to especially I mean Wayne Rooney's kind of a draw I think that's fair to say and this is the first chance many people if not everyone in Orlando's had to see him in person so I'm sure that'll do a lot yeah this will be his first trip to Orlando if I'm not mistaken ever well, I mean, to play in Orlando. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't think I can't think of any any recent, um, other than maybe if he's been here to visit his brother at some point. Ah, yes. Who can forget old John Rooney, who used to play for Orlando City back in 2012? I, I guarantee a lot of people have forgotten about John Rooney. I have, funny enough, seen a number ten Rooney jersey from 2012 flying around Orlando City Stadium at points in time. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that is a rarity right there. Mainly because well, John Rooney sucks. I hate to say it, but he's <laughs> he he was not good enough to play at Orlando City in 2012. He somehow made it to the New York Red Bulls back in uh what was it 2010, 2011? Didn't make it there. Went to USL, didn't make it there. Went to fourth division England, didn't make it there, and I think ended up playing in fifth or sixth division in England, like non league. And I can't, I don't know if he's still playing now. Let me check very quickly. Yeah, he's playing with Barrow, and uh, Barrow is currently in the National League. <laughs> wow, yeah, National League is fifth tier England. Not to be confused oh. with baseball's National League, which does kick off on uh, tomorrow if you're listening to this on Wednesday. Or today, if you're listening to this on Thursday, or yesterday, if okay, you're just, listening just, to this on Friday. You just stop confusing people. <laughs> okay, so he well, went... I mean, everyone sees the links at different times. That's true. Okay, so Orlando City, he went to Barnsley, then Bury, went on loan to Chester, signed with Chester, then went to Wrexham, then Geisley, signed for Geisley after going on loan with them, and now is at Barrow. Uh, at Chester, he played over 100 matches and scored 25 goals. Uh, oh. That is sixth tier of England. I oh. believe at the time that he was playing, it was a bit. It was one lower. Basically, you and I could probably compete in that league. Uh, mm, mm, I don't know. They're athletic. That's true. I mean, I'm sure even the worst soccer players in England are probably better than the average Americans. D- yes. Uh, yes, yeah. because they grow up yeah. playing soccer. Yeah, uh, that's true. God, he's only 28 years old. John Rooney, he's a year older than I am. That's unbelievable. That's so weird. <laughs> Anyways, that's that's John Rooney. So John Rooney, yeah, ties to Orlando City. Does the Rooney family have? But yes, like you said, this will be the first time that a lot of people will get to see the legendary English captain Wayne Rooney playing here in Orlando. Could be one of your only times. You don't know how long he's going to be in the league. As long as he's with DC United, though, he'll be making a few trips to Orlando over the next few years. As long as his contract remains, he's a. I mean, it's it should be fun just for the the Rooney aspect of things, but also for Orlando if they can play 
with a similar game plan that they had to New York, and they plan it out, and they, they're ready to go. They had an extra day to prepare because of a Sunday game instead of a Saturday game. That could help their chances. And the fact that they're coming off a win, confidence is high, you can build off of that. So there's hope there. But at the same time, it's it's not the team that has proven themselves yet. I know a lot of people are excited about the win, but don't get too high on your highs and don't get too low on your lows. So one one game does not mean that you're, this is the start of something great. You hope it is, but also just keep a level head and say, okay, well, put a string a few good games together and then talk. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I completely agree with you, and I think we're still at that point where we're trying to figure out where this Orlando City team is and who they are. Obviously, four games is a very small sample size. You know, we're we're kind of seeing things, we're seeing glimpses, but at the same time, it's there have been points where it's like a one step forward, two steps back kind of thing, especially with that Montreal game. Because like, yeah, I I would say there's a couple areas where I've been really impressed with them. I think game planning wise, James O'Connor seemingly has his team prepared just about every week to, to do what he needs them to do to, to take on the opponents. We saw it against uh, New York. They played them really well. They, they outplayed Chicago. They played Chicago really well for you know most of the match. Uh, you know, the Montreal game, I think we can all agree now, especially after the Red Bull performance, that that's just kind of a throwaway. You know, we talked all week about how it was really unexpected and we didn't see any of it coming and it's probably not Orlando city, although it could be, but I think they proved that it wasn't. And, you know, they went into Red Bull Arena with a plan and they executed it really well. And you got to give James O'Connor credit for that. And I think that if that's obviously Orlando's not going to win every game, their their game plans are not always going to be effective. But if they go in there prepared and they at least know what they're supposed to be doing, then they have a good chance to win. And we've seen that so far in three of the four games. Yeah, I, I do want to make a few notations on that game, uh, the Red Bulls game, right? If Orlando come away with a draw, how much does the narrative shift to this was a bad game plan? Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't going to work from the start. Or even if they lose, you know, by by a goal, how much does the narrative shift back to oh, we're still crap, we're still terrible. Fire James O'Connor. He's got terrible lineups. Why is he playing this guy and not this guy? You know, it, it, one goal changes literally the entire conversation we're having. And just keep that in this mind. Is against New York. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, keep that in mind because, you know, you go from a good performance in Chicago to a bad performance against Montreal and then a good performance again in New York, but this time you see it out after 90 minutes. So, you know, well, you, 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 you can't just look at the result and say, oh, yeah, this was terrible. Wow, we're terrible. You got to look at the game as a whole and you say, well, did they compete for 90 minutes? How bad were they beaten? You know, were they in it? Were they creating chances? Were they right in the game? Because that that tells you how good Orlando City is going to be over the next you know few games of the season and into the bulk of the regular season. It's not just the results that will speak to how Orlando is developed as a team. I think I absolutely agree with you, and I'll point to the national team, which we'll kind of talk about more going forward. But when you look at the United States now, under Greg Berhalter. The wins are nice, but they don't matter. What you look for with the national team is, are they improving? Are they getting better? Is there a sign that everything is working, that Berhalter is getting getting his message across to the players? And we saw against Ecuador that, yes, that is the case. Now, it wasn't perfect. It's, not, it's far from complete, but you can see the building blocks there. You can see the ideas getting across. And if you could see that with James O'Connor, like I mean, like you said, Orlando played well enough to win the game against New York, but they didn't. That doesn't mean they played bad. They gave up a couple goals on some, you know, good opportunities from New York. Same thing with Chicago. They played a good game plan, and at the end of the day, they could have won that game, but it was one, one little moment that lost it for them. They didn't lose the 90 minutes. They lost one little span of five seconds. So, you know, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Yeah. And the last thing I want to talk about, the lineups, right? A lot of criticism came down against James O'Connor for the lineup he put out against the Red Bulls, right? So it was Santiago Patino starting up top instead of Dom Dwyer. 
who they said uh, was on a minutes restriction due to him not having a preseason, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jean Moutinho at left wing back instead of Danilo Acosta, who's been playing very well. Apparently, he's also on a minutes restriction. Who knows? That that's a bit more confusing than Dom because Dom actually didn't have a preseason. Right. To my knowledge, I mean, Danilo Acosta didn't have any injury come up during preseason, did he? No. Not. I mean, not yeah. that was reported at least. And not not only that, but he didn't. He wasn't even on the bench, so it's not like he traveled with the team. If you're he, holding he, his he, minutes. He did travel with the team. Oh, he traveled. He just didn't. Wasn't in the lineup. Correct. He wasn't in the 18, but he was physically, he traveled, because like there's pictures of him traveling with the team to the airport and in the airport physically okay. with him. Okay. I mean, I I don't know if maybe he is telling the truth here, but that just seems like a weird one on top of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, why would he travel if he was on a minutes restriction? Right. It could have just been a last second knock. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, I, it could have makes... been, it could have been maybe they got to New York and something happened. I mean, like, honestly, it's all up for speculation but what's that worth yeah maybe maybe he banged his knee getting out of the plane yeah who, exactly. i mean who knows honestly but uh, uh, go back to the lineup in a whole, as a whole right a lot of people said wow this is such a terrible lineup and then they come out with the performance they did and like the tune changes right and i had someone and i can't really say who uh, i had someone related to the club text me and they said this was after the game obviously and they said, "Wow, goes to show you uh, what people who work at Universal know." Mm-hmm. So, That's funny. You know, it, it's it's just interesting seeing something like that. That was it, it was so unfounded to give flack to a lineup that you see and you say, "Wow, this doesn't look like it's going to work." But who who knows better than the coaching staff that is paid to do this kind of stuff? Right, you can you can kind of go off against the lineup if you don't believe in it, but also like these are the guys that are working every single day with these players. If they don't get the lineups right, that's on them and their jobs, which is already kind of in question, you know, considering the history of coaches in Orlando. So it's not like they're going to put out a lineup that they don't think will work. Mm-hmm. So I, yeah. I just I just sometimes I don't understand people's rationale when it comes to chastising lineups. And well, that's really my red card for the day, too. So, <laughs> I mean, you've Austin, you've known me for a, a few years and you've known my ability to get irrational at times. And uh, oh, at just at times, kind of. Could, yeah. Yeah. Every now and again <laughs> and, and kind of go out there. I've I've learned my way through the years to to hold back to just see things as they are because like you said we're looking at it from the surface we don't know what's going on underneath we don't know what's happening in the locker room what's going on in in meetings between the coaching staff the best the only thing that we can do is look at it observe it and then if it works give them praise and if it doesn't then we can give them crap for it you know like that's that's really just save your opinions until you see what actually happens kind of like don't judge a book by its cover don't don't judge a a game because of the lineup graphic that was tweeted out like that means nothing oh yeah macho man agrees (laughs) thank you macho yeah again sit take a step back and just understand that what what james is trying to do is is what is win that's simple as that right i mean i've got into this argument with people on twitter before like james o'connor's a good coach he's won championships Albeit like in a lower division, but he that he still he's a soccer coach that knows how to coach. He knows what he's doing. Let him do what he's doing, and if it doesn't work, then you can complain about it. Exactly right. If, if it doesn't work, then you can say, "Wow, you should have done this." Yeah, and hindsight's, hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. So, the, the, there is a question though about why Josue Coleman did not travel or play with the team. Though I feel like that's kind of valid i think it was didn't i think jordan said that um the tactics i guess this is from james o'connor's that the tactics didn't really fit Josue coleman in this game so they didn't bother bringing him putting him in the lineup i mean i i completely agree with that it's just yeah interesting is all because i mean mean, the physicality of the new york red bulls is something that Josue isn't really accustomed to yet 
Like right. he can he can ride some challenges, but when those challenges are coming from three people around you, he's good on the ball. But when you need to make those quick passes to get out of pressure, not as much. And you have to be very quick and accurate with those passes to break that pressure from the Red Bulls. So yeah, I get it. Um, it, it couldn't. I, think have, we, I, I feel like it couldn't have hurt to travel him though, and right. at least put him on the bench in case you need him. But I guess with with the way that Patino, like his game was suited for this game. Patino, mm-hmm. Patino's game was suited for this game. His physicality up top, his touch. There was that one chance that he had on the breakaway, and it was it was so good up until that final touch that he had to make. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought he was really good. And I think when you, speaking of coal mine, when you look at the way that Orlando City played, I mean, you, this isn't the kind of game where they're looking. They're going to hold the ball. They're going to have possession. And they're just going to be picking opportunities. The ball was kicked around, the ball was bounced around, and it was really just when we have an opportunity, we're gonna we're gonna run for it right then and there. We don't have the opportunity to sit back and be patient with it and kind of like you said, play to the style that Jose Coleman likes to play or is, is better suited for. I mean, you've got a guy like Sasha Kleshin out there, and that's really all you have room for in the midfield in this kind of situation. Yeah. And again, how about Sasha Kleshin? Yeah. How good was he against his former team? Not only the goal, but uh, you you wrote about this right on on Orlando Soccer Journal, osjsoccer.com, or or or, or orlsoccerjournal.com is is the new website. Um, shameless plug for you. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you, you break it down, um, for me. break it down, yeah, all the stats. Give me them. I'm looking. Let me let me see. I got them. I got them right here. I got them right here. So. Um, he got uh, 73 touches on the ball. He was hit with one key pass, obviously with the goal, uh, three tackles, two clearances. He completed seven, 67 of his 49 passes, which were the most for Orlando City um, in the game. I mean, he had hold on, he was all over. How what what, what was how many passes what? did he complete? 40. No, he completed 67 percent of 49 passes. Okay, if only if only he completed a few more passes, got in his better yeah. percentage up, just two percentage points. And it, and if you look at his passing chart, a lot of his passes that weren't completed were ones that were for 10 yards or more. Right. And there, I mean, a lot of like the passing percentage for Orlando in that game was so bad because mm-hmm. they were just booting balls downfield at the end of the game. Like they weren't mm-hmm. even trying to make they weren't trying to combine passes. They were just clearing the ball downfield as much as possible and letting somebody try and run on it. That yeah, was it. And he, he also did have that pass too that started the play that you mentioned with Patino from basically the end, you know a couple yards away from the end line to just, just rocket the ball down midfield perfectly for him to get past through the defense. Yeah. And one one other player or okay, let, let, let's just run the back line really quickly. Uh Shane O'Neill started the play that got Orlando the goal. And I feel like people probably don't want to give him credit for that because they're all on the uh, the hate train for Shane. Mm. Uh, there, there were still moments where he looked like he he was too timid on the ball, like he he didn't he was just booting the ball, and I get you know that's kind of the game plan for what they were going for, but you know I want to see more confidence from the kid. I feel like he has it in him, and we talked about this last week on the show. It's just something he's got to work through. Uh, Alex, hey, Jones, ask, go ahead. I was gonna say ask Quest too. Yeah, and that's that's just for him. It's had a moment like that where he gave the ball away in a poor spot just like he did against Montreal and, and then almost re- cost Orlando a goal. Right. And then he redeemed himself with the goal line clearance. Right. I'm surprised that he made team of the week cuz his performance was average. Like Janssen should have yeah. been there instead of Asquez. Yeah, I didn't like he didn't necessarily stand out for me and like he wasn't like you say he wasn't bad, he wasn't great, but he he did his job in spots where he needed to do it and I think that to put him on team of the week. I mean, in fairness, there were only five games and uh, some of the teams did not look very good this weekend. So right, but I'm sure that the pickings were slim. Yeah. But, I mean, you look at who got in for Orlando. It was question Rowe, Asquez fair, and who on Ruan had a good game. He had a couple opportunities, Yeah, but he didn't finish um, them. Like he got in good spaces, right, but that's like saying Mohamed right. Al-Manir had a good game by just, you know, being there it's yeah. you know it's 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 a guy that's fast he's quick he gets behind the lines and that's great but if you can't do anything with it it's useless 
Right. And I think that's, I mean, his one redeeming quality is obviously that he has the speed. I mean, I, I don't expect my right back to have the finishing touches, but like you said, I mean, he's, he's in a position where he also probably should have passed it off. I don't remember who it was, but there was somebody right there that he could have laid it off to. I think it was probably Patino um, in that scenario where he could have, he could have, and probably should have at least tempted to lay it off to the guy that can finish. Right. But in uh, that, in that, in, in those situations, you can't overthink it because you're, you're going in on goal. You're one-on-one with the keeper. You only have a finite amount of time to think right. about what you want to do. And sometimes you just don't think you just do. And I don't, I, I could be wrong. I'd have to, I might would have to go back and watch it again, but I think he doesn't even look up to see Patino or whoever that was in the middle of the penalty area with, with plenty of space to get it. Right. And that's, that's I mean, going to kind of what a right back, I mean, is not going to have those instincts in that moment. Most likely like you're saying, well, especially if you're playing with a guy who you don't necessarily play with often. Right. That's something right. Uh, again, it's it's chemistry. If you if you understand that this guy's here to make the run and you you play hit with him in practice often and you see him making that run all the time, you're more likely to pass it to the guy because you assume that he's going to make that run cuz you're just used to him making that run. But if you don't play with him, if you practice with him, but if you're on a different team and you're practicing with like the other team, like the starters and not the bench side and then Patino comes in to start, that chemistry isn't there as much as it would be with say a Dom Dwyer. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things that's also stood out to me about Nani being with the team is he sees things that are just being as talented as as you know as world traveled as he has been, he sees plays and opportunities that players for Orlando City have not seen since probably Kaká. Mm-hmm. And the ability the ability to just know I'm going to put it here and usually, and most often, it's with Dom Dwyer, is because you know Dom Dwyer is obviously a very prolific striker, and he knows where, to, when, and where to make the runs. And those two have connected up so well. But Nani sees the opportunities, and he's going to put that pass out there. And you better expect, you better hope you're you're in position to get to it. Yeah, and, and Nani was really shut down by the Red yeah. Bulls this this uh, this game. And you talk about Dwyer and Nani, the two up front, uh, the. The whole Dwyer being shut down thing was what led to Orlando getting a goal. Because, mm-hmm. and again, this is something else you talked about on your article. As soon as Dwyer made that run into the box, two center backs ran with him. And when the cross came to the top of the box, no one was there to mark question until it was mm-hmm. too late. Right. And, and that's, the- that's the kind of thing that we, Orlando hasn't had recently because with Kaká on the field, it was very much the same way. You get he gets double team, he's dragging guys over, and it opens up space and other in better areas for guys to do things. But the way the team has been the last couple of years, the same situation. Or teams were able to double team Dwyer and take him out of the game. But in years, but in, in years like last year, they didn't have anyone, or they didn't really have the the awareness to be able to send balls into other players and and really use that open space that they have. They just, this year they're a little bit more talented and they can finally take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. And uh, also just, just to note, uh, it was a uh, Portuguese guy on the left who had the assist, but it wasn't. (laughs) Yeah. So it was close enough. Yeah. But if you put that into a category, uh, what was it? Three out of the four games, there has been a Portuguese player that has had an assist on a goal. Three out of the four games. Outside right. of Montreal. Oh, yeah, that's fair. Because yeah, Nani that's, had... I guess that's Nani's, Nani has two. Yeah. And Moutinho. Yeah. Huh. Dom, Fun got, randoms- Dom, and, uh, Dom and O'Neal got the assist for that goal too, right? I don't know if O'Neal got the official assist. Dom, no. I don't even know if he got the assist either because... I, I remember they said on the MSG broadcast afterwards that they gave him an assist. I have Dom? To go back and double check. Yeah. They gave Dom, Dom an assist. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's another thing with with assists. The way Opta gives assists is really stupid sometimes. So there do you remember there was a um there was a play in 2017 where Carlos Rivas had like a little back heel flick to MSG or MPG, MSG. <laughs> <laughs> MPG. Uh, and then he threaded it through for Kyle Laren to score the goal, right? You would think that'd be a secondary assist for Rivas because he lays it off for MPG to thread through to Laren. I think it was the Philadelphia goal that he had in the second game of the season in 2017, right? 
So they didn't give him an assist because they said it was going against the run of play. Huh. And so when I saw the Dwyer pass, I was thinking, wow, they're probably not going to give him an assist because it's a lateral pass. It's not necessarily pushing Moutinho forward. And then I watched the replay. I'm like, well, that's still, I mean, that's close. It's pretty, it's, it's going forward. I guess you could give it to him. And sure enough, they gave it to him. So Dom got an assist. So good for him. Yeah. Uh, Joe Moutinho and Dom Dwyer assisted on this goal. So Hey, any, any guesses on how many assists Dom Dwyer has this season? It's two, right? Yeah. Guess how many he had last yeah. year? <laughs> I might guess like one. Zero. No. Oh. <laughs> two goals, two assists yeah. for Dom this year in four games played, which means he has been a part of four goals in four games. Which, I mean, when you think about it, like, that's a, that's a pace that Orlando City needs if they're going to be successful. I mean, you need him, obviously, to score goals. But if he's able to contribute, just think about what that means, not only for, for him, but for the team around him, that he finally has players where he can lay it off to to, to create an opportunity. It does, it's not solely on Dom Dwyer now to be the goal scorer, and that's kind of a big step for Orlando City. Yeah, well, I mean, when Dom came into the team in 2017, he had four goals and four assists in 12 games. Yeah, and that and was, that was that's Aaron. by the way four four assists is the most he's ever had in a season. Oh wow! I think it's I wonder if the system here in uh in Orlando just kind of makes him more open. Well, he's to, playing. To he's laying off he's playing up. He's playing with someone up top. He's like right. in, in, KC, in KC. He was a lone guy. Well, kind of. They were in like a four three three. So he had the wingers, but oh. he was like the top guy. Yeah, I mean, he did. He was playing alongside uh, Namath for a while too. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I you know, it, because more is asked of him in this Orlando City system comparatively, that kind of allows him to be maybe more of an assist man. Yeah, in in Kansas City, he was able to just kind of get in the box, open spaces, and then run through back lines and just get right. the ball and finish. He has a lot of assists that aren't necessarily credited to him because of those runs that he made that opened up space for other people. Right, right. Which is, you know, it it's good. <laughs> if you can get, if you, they paid a lot of money from him, if you can get him involved in more ways, obviously he's got the talent. You You want him to use it. You want him to utilize every bit of skill he has to make this team better. And he's doing that at least so far when he plays this year yep and hopefully by sunday he'll be able to play a few more minutes yeah yeah so uh any other talking points from this game i think we've covered all of them just about yeah yeah uh i think it's fair to say shout out brian rowe for being good yeah as as much crap as he gets uh he's actually been pretty good the last couple games yeah it's almost like he just had to ease himself into it. Go, yeah, go go. Figure. It's just one. It's one of those things. Just goalkeeper for Orlando City historically is just such a scrutinized position. And if you're not a Tally Hall or a Miguel Gallardo, <laughs> you're nobody. Right. Well, uh, here's the thing: the way that goalkeepers are in Orlando, you have to set a good example for yourself very early on, or else you will get a bad rep. Right. right? <clears throat> Bendick in some of his first ever games made some massive saves that beloved him to the fan base but Roe didn't and so people were like ah well he's not as good as Bendik and you know it's just because he didn't make a few big saves now he's starting to to get his way into it a little bit uh not necessarily making huge saves but I mean he kept a clean sheet and what was it the first clean sheet for Orlando in like months it was a while yeah yeah um and I think I think one of the interesting things too is when Brian Brian Rowe and Joe Bendick didn't come in to a lot of confidence with them. You know, when you think of Bendick, he came in as a guy who is so so with Toronto, never really got big opportunities. So it was like the expectations weren't high for him. So when he did come out and make those saves, it was all suddenly like, Oh wow, we can actually get behind this guy. As for Brian Rowe, he's coming in as like a free agent, hasn't played well in a couple of years make some mistakes in his first couple of games. So then it's just easy like, oh yeah, you know, we got this unwanted goalkeeper off the waivers or whatever, and he's not performing. Tally Hall, meanwhile, you know, everyone was excited about him. He was, uh, I think he was coming off like a, he was a goalkeeper of the year or something in MLS before yes. 
joining Orlando. So, I mean, there was, and then obviously he comes out and man the wall for Tally Hall, all that kind of stuff, you know, his own little cult following here in Orlando and he makes huge saves and he set the bar high for what the expectations are for a goalkeeper here. And, and yet, and yet still setting the bar high in that year of 2015 where they still conceded, uh, what was it? How many? Uh, 56 goals. Yeah, I think the ironic thing was like when they cut him, it was like, yeah, hey, Joe Manning makes or Tally Hall makes all these great saves, but then it was like, but he also kind of lets in a lot of goals. So like, right? No, eh. he was he was cut because of his ACL tear again. Yeah, and it that's was, the second. Was, that was the second. He like he was joining Orlando off an ACL tear. Yeah, and then when you mess it up again, it's rough. Yeah, I mean, you're he was what like thirty three at the time. So I mean, he was an old goalkeeper on a second major knee injury for a team that plays on turf. Yeah. At that point, you kind of almost had to. Yeah. No, it's it not the greatest of situations. And he ended up retiring and becoming a police officer now. So yeah, it worked out best. I mean, to an extent, but he's still an Orlando guy. He's still around. So yeah. that's, you know, still beloved by the yeah. community, I guess. A guy that would probably be a good guest on this podcast. Soon. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of hard getting a police officer. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what's the protocol for that? Do we have to go through the Orlando know. PD? I don't know. Do they have a PR person, like, that you'd have to go through? I would think so. I mean, if they have someone who runs a Twitter account. True. Very true. Eh, one of these days, maybe we'll get him on. We'll figure it out. We could probably always just DM him and be like, hey. He doesn't on, do he's not on social first? anymore. He's not on, t- he's not on social media? Tally Hall? Yeah. I think he deleted his Twitter. I got somebody named Tally Hall that Simon follows. It does not look like Tally Hall. Though. No, I think that's the band Tally Hall. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, that makes sense. Because Simon's the only one that follows him. <laughs> Simon does follow a lot of people. Anyways, we're getting uh, off track. Let's talk about the Orlando Pride. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's just what it's one word. Can we say? Um, they learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, that that was that first, was what Mark Skinner team. said. Mark Skinner said, "We learned a lot." As a matter of fact, you you want to listen to what Mark Skinner said about the team and about the it would the game? Be helpful. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and pull up Mark Skinner's uh, recap of what he saw in that game against North Carolina Courage. Um, I think look, North Carolina took the chances we we gave to them. I think. Um, what today was about for me was about finding the best opposition, clearly from their league status, um, and seeing if we can, how we can find a way around beating them. And what we found today was lots and lots of learning experiences. So, of course, the one thing I'll never be happy is the result. I want to win every game, um, but I'm also three weeks into what we're trying to do. So, we put things in place today, and I was really, really pleased with the girls' attitude towards doing that because I think he found from that perspective that we were trying to do things that if you can keep practicing, keep practicing, keep practicing, give the benefit a little bit longer down the line. And um, I think from today, I've, I've seen a lot of quality moments from the girls, obviously score lines are just differently. So you, you kind of get the perspective a little bit from Coach Skinner there. It, this wasn't a game that like they expected really to win necessarily. And so it was just a learning lesson for him and his staff and the players and what, you know, what the pinnacle of NWSL soccer can be and what they are striving to get to. And I think that's setting the precedent for Skinner's tenure with the Orlando Pride by saying like, okay, this is how we start the season, right? This is, this is what we get through to start the season. And the more you play good teams like that, the, the, the teams that aren't as good seem so much easier. And then you can play to the competition. Yeah, I think. I mean, you know, they're they're at the stage where they're they're still trying to learn things. They're you know, it's a it's essentially in a similar way that we talk about Atlanta United going under a whole new kind of culture change, mm-hmm. going from Tata to Frank DeBoer. It's very similar to uh, Tom Sermani to Mark Skinner and. It, these things are going to take time. I mean, it's obviously still largely the same group of players who are, you know, 
the 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 bigger players, Alex Morgan, you know, for example, and Marta, these guys have been with their national teams, so they're getting into camp a little bit later than the rest, and it's uh, not too worried. <laughs> Uh, I guess this is the easiest way to say it. Yeah. A lot of time left to go. Uh, they'll be playing the University of South Florida in a scrimmage coming up next week that's closed to everyone, including media. So don't even bother trying to look for that because you won't be able to find anything about it unless USF actually tweets a scoreline. Uh, <laughs> they'll be playing some other college teams. Uh, Skinner said that the last two weeks they played uh, an inter squad scrimmage and then they also played a boys team. Uh, to try and match the level of physicality that other teams may bring. So, you know, I guess he asked the, the boys to to play physical against them. And, oh, that's, um, yeah. That's a new approach. It's actually not. Sermani did a lot, too. Oh, did he? Yeah. It's an approach that a lot of coaches have used over the years. They just don't publicize things like that. Right. Yeah. I think Montverde played the Pride last year, as a matter of fact. It does sound right. That sounds like something I've heard before. Yeah, well, there you go. All right, well, um, last thing we'll talk about in terms of Orlando-related soccer, I guess, is Orlando City speaking B. Speaking of Montbird. Yeah, <laughs> speaking of Montbird, great transition. Oh, so planned. So, OCB, Orlando City B, they open up their season this Saturday. Exciting times. Yeah, against uh, Tucson FC, I believe it is. Yes. That game is at Monteverde if you want to go for some reason. Um, they won't charge for tickets. Oh, yeah, we have free tickets. I mean, honestly, if you're in the area, you might as well just go see some free soccer, see kind of the future of Orlando City. Um, I've got the roster up, and I'll I'll be straightforward, honestly. I don't know much about many of these players, but it'll be a learning experience for me as well. I'll be home to watch the game on Saturday night, which you can watch on ESPN Plus, all games all season long, and on YouTube if you want. So that's actually pretty cool. Uh, to, to watch on YouTube, you have to be away from the U.S., though. So if you're in Canada, yeah. lucky yeah, you. If you're outside of the U.S., if you're in international waters on a cruise, you or if you can have watch a, it as well. If you have a VPN, too. If you just yeah, fake yeah, your location, is. you're good to go. Yeah, if you're trying to hide from the U.S. government, you can watch this game as well. Yes. Um, looking at the roster, like I said, I don't know a lot, but here is kind of what I'll be looking for. You know, there's a lot of Orlando City Academy players in this. There's also a handful of Montverde Academy players in this. Um, if you're looking for Orlando City kids, uh, Jordan Bender is one to watch. 17-year-old midfielder, uh, played in the Academy. US, U17 national teamer. That's a, you know, kind of a big deal there. So an up-and-comer in both the national team system. Uh, they got a, a guy named Brandon John, Canadian defender with the U17, U20 national teams. Uh, he's 23 years old, so he's a little bit older, kind of a guy that's, um, I guess, more more forward in his development. If he's going to make any jumps, it's going to be soon. Um, he did play with Sounders, too. So, I mean, he's been, you know, doesn't look like he's kind of the guy to maybe watch, but he's somebody with talent. Um, let's see. I don't know. There's not really a whole lot of names that stand out to me, uh, to be honest with you, because I don't uh, you don't know have them. the knowledge. Yeah, and I, I as, as stupid as I feel saying that, but, you know. It's, uh, it's called research, Gavin. Yeah. Uh, do it's hard to do research on these kids when there's, you know, 16 and 17 years old. I think the youngest player on the field on the roster is 15 years old. Yeah. Average age is like 19. So, mm -hmm. um, was it Luke? The Graniter. Gr Graniter, yeah. U.S. Uh, U16 national teamer. Mm -hmm. Also an Orlando City Academy kid, so. Yeah, he's one to he's definitely one to watch out for. I'd say Jelani Forbes is another kid to watch out for. Those are the two like very promising products when it comes to just the the youngest of the players. Right? Yeah. I think I think um I think he's 16. Yeah. Yeah. 16-year-old defender. He's also U U17 national teamer, Orlando City Academy. Yep. Those are two kids that I'd watch out for if I were you. And then they got a, flu yeah. a few kids from Atletico Paranaense as well on loan. Uh, one of them is the probable starting goalkeeper. Yeah. I mean, you think about or like Orlando City B2 is probably a little bit more interesting than ever because not much came from Orlando City B the first time around. But under Luis Buzzi now, with the direction of youth that they're going to certainly start moving towards, watching these games is certainly going to be important because 
you're you're probably going to see at least a couple of these kids playing for Orlando City as soon as maybe next year, and maybe not next year, but you'll see them, you know, getting chances within the very near future. Yeah, and that's the whole point is for yeah. these kids to develop in a professional environment. And you know, they, mean, they they've still got the Montverde Academy, so like they can still like go to school and go to classes if they need to. Cuz I mean, just think about like I get a little bit jealous watching teams like FC Dallas and the just slew of homegrown talent that they throw out there. Five homegrown players were in their starting lineup last week against Colorado. Six players for RSL, and those teams are playing each other this weekend. Can you imagine like how many homegrown players are going to be on the field when those two meet up? And that's just like... It's a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, you look at the players that Dallas produces, and they got Paxton Pomichol out there right now, who's probably one of the most impactful players for them produced right there in their academy mm -hmm. that's something that you should be looking forward to and what you should be watching for you're not you might not find the next paxton pomegal on this ocb team but you might be able to find someone that in a couple of years is going to be you know be making impactful starts making impactful minutes for orlando city yeah okay so uh let's move on from orlando soccer to soccer in orlando uh, the U.S. men's national team won one nothing against the uh, Ecuadorian national team, and then they won in Houston, or sorry, they tied in Houston, one one with Chile uh, last night. I it, it was okay. Ecuador sat back and defended a lot, and Giassi Zardes got a really stupid goal, typical Giassi Zardes kind of thing. And in the game against Chile. Great touch from Jassy Zardes, which is just a weird thing to say. Uh, pass over to Pulisic, who scored, and uh, yeah, Christian Pulisic, fantastic player. So he scored the goal very early on. Uh, they gave away a cheap goal later on, and uh, they just it, nothing happened after that. So it was one one. They they look okay. I'll, I'll say that they look better. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned before. Um... The game against Ecuador certainly brought a lot of positivity. It's it's just weird and refreshing watching a United States men's national team game where there's a plan where you can see what they're trying to do, where the players don't look confused, and it looks like actual good soccer. We haven't had that in years. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's been a while. It's been a yeah. while. Suffered through I mean, uh, Jurgen Klinsmann's later years, and then most recently Bruce Arena. Yeah, I, it, I'm I'm very excited to watch United States men's national teams games again, and we haven't said that in a while. And like even before the failure to qualify for the World Cup, like there was just such a gloom over the national team that was not like even if they had made it to the World Cup, would there have been excitement? going into it like would there have been real optimism like i don't think so even though like that whole the whole 2018 was just kind of a lost year it's good to be it's good to feel optimism again and be able to watch these games and think all right we're there's actually building going on here you know christian Pulisic and, and weston mckinney and uh, tyler adams all these guys can finally start bringing what they have to the field and it means something now and that's fun <laughs> it's it's fun yes it's fun yeah, to win and it's fun to it. actually see players develop and meanwhile we're not right. even we're not even talking about the guys that are with the u23s and you know jason Kreis. yeah <laughs> i think that's the the whole you've seen monty python and the holy grail before right sure mm, that sounds like you haven't <laughs> i'm gonna assume you haven't because you haven't seen a lot of good movies wasn't monty python a tv show Someone tweet Gavin and tell him to watch something good. <laughs> what was the show that you were watching uh, the finale of last week when we recorded? Oh, it's actually on right now. It's called Temptation Island. See, no. It's that's... the second part of the finale. You've watched none of the Marvel movies. You have yeah. not watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That's not true. I watched one of the... the um... The Avengers. I think it might have been the first one. Colby Smolders was in it. That's all I really remember. They were on like a big. Uh, um, what's You're the digging word yourself a it? hole. A carrier ship. Yes. Is that the it? first one? Yeah. 
Yeah, so you have I remember no, seeing part of that one in class. No frame of reference, though, and you watched it because you had to. Yeah. Yeah, they put it on. See? It was an art class. Stop. Stop. I just remember Colby Smothers because I like her. <sighs> Anyways, I, my yeah. whole f- reference was gone out the window because you wouldn't <laughs> get it. All right, so now, switching gears a little bit, we've got a special guest joining us on the podcast today. Uh, I talked to him earlier today, as a matter of fact. Uh, he is a, a well-known English player. He has played for many teams, and you probably don't realize it. You see him every week on the Orlando City television broadcast. Uh, he has actually coached a uh, USL team back in 2011, FC New York, which lasted all of one season. Actually, sorry, he played and was their assistant coach and their interim head coach after they fired their uh, head coach during the middle of the season. That was, you know, already bungled from the start. He is a former Arsenal, Millwall, Sheffield, Rotherham, Chesterfield, Oxford United, uh, Renford United, and FC New York player. He is the current academy coach of Orlando City and former U23 head coach from 2013 to 2016. And, of course, which you probably know him more by, he is the TV analyst for Orlando City Games. It is Paul Shaw. And uh, we got the chance to sit down and talk to him about a lot, uh, mainly, you know, him and what he's doing with the club now and what the structure of, of the Youth Academy is looking like from the outside perspective of Montverde and, and then the inside perspective of Montverde and, you know, just a little bit about what youth development is coming about. But also... We talked about a really cool school that he is involved in. It's called Virum Academy. Uh, it is very unique to the U.S., maybe not necessarily the world, but uh, it is basically a soccer school. So these are kids that want to pursue soccer as a, as, as a career, or at least as a collegiate career. Uh, these are kids that will uh, come to school at 8 a.m. They will train from basically 8 until 1030 and then go to class. And then after they go to class, they finish school, then they go to their club teams and train there. So it's a very soccer-specific, regimented kind of uh, curriculum. And it's just very unique. Uh, I got to tour the school a few weeks ago, and uh, it's it's really unique. I'm, I'm just going to pass it over to the interview, and you can listen to a little bit of what Paul has to say about uh, you know what he's involved in with the school. So here's the interview with Paul Shaw. All right, so joining us now is a man who needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyways. Uh, he is a uh, former Arsenal, Millwall, uh, Sheffield, Oxford, and uh, ooh, FC New York player, uh, former manager of the Orlando City U23 team, uh, director of the Orlando City Academy, and broadcaster for Orlando City Soccer Games on Fox and My65. It is Paul Shaw. Paul, thank you for coming today. Thanks very much for having me, Austin. Good to be here. Right. So I wanted to sit down with you to talk a little bit about you, Mm -hmm. basically, uh, where you've come from, where you've been. I kind of listed your your accolades a little bit Mm -hmm. just now, but I want to get a, a, I want to hear it from you and and a little bit of your story uh, and what you're doing now with, uh, well, where we are. And we'll we'll get to that in a bit. But uh, you started your career in the youth of Arsenal. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you spent six years there? Certainly did. I, I joined them from school at 16, as you as you did at the, in, in those days, as you, as you, as you say it. But uh, joined at 16 full-time. Um, I was there till I was 22. I was, at 17, I signed um, my first pro contract with Arsenal. Made my debut at 18. Um, and uh, obviously went through the youth teams into reserves and... Uh, into the first team, as you can imagine at that time, or being at Arsenal, it was a great experience, a fantastic upbringing for me. Um, but the competition was incredible, you know, at the time. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be in and around the first team for 18 months of Arsene Wenger's first 18 months when he was there, um, which was great, a great learning curve. That was just really the start of them bringing in a lot of obviously foreign players, players like Patrick Vieira were there at the time. Um, Dennis Bergkamp, um, Nicholas and Elka, and they so they started obviously to 
to really bring in some foreign players. Um, and I think, as you, you, as you said, I think about 22 were moved on, moved to Millwall. Um, but I was very lucky. I must admit, I was very lucky. I played professionally for, for 20 years um, and uh, really lucky as far as, obviously, injuries. Um, you know, I was really disciplined as far as my, my fitness and uh, diet, things like that, so I managed to continue to play. But I loved it, you know, and, uh, you know, I was, I was really fortunate to have a, such a long career. So now you mentioned Millwall, and I, I brought that up because, um, you know, it's a very interesting club. Obviously, um, I have a scarf. I, I went to visit the uh, the stadium, and I, I bought a scarf that says "No one likes us." Yep. Um, were you, um, when did that start again? The I mean, all all of that. I mean, yeah. I, I, obviously, probably around about twenty twenty five years ago that started. Yeah. yeah. So, what was it like being a part of of all of that? So it was it was a, it was a fantastic club. Um, I think the one part that you have to remember is it's it's in South London. Mm-hmm. The club's in South London, South East London. It's a it's a working men's club. Um, they, they they really just just pride themselves on their players and everybody part of the club just giving one hundred percent every single day. And as long as you do that, they appreciate you and they'll give you as much back in as as they can. If you don't, they will let you know and. Um, they they they've had some some tough times with their supporters as far as uh, and 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 you know they've had some bad publicity. Um, some of that has been justified, some of it not. And uh, but to be honest, I had a great time there. The support was 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 incredible. Um, but as I said, it was a, it was a tough place to play. Really, you know, you you had to perform and you had to do well. Um, but if you did give 100% every single game and fought on that field, they appreciated you. And uh, it was, as I said, there were some people that didn't, and it was a, it's a tough place to play for not, not just opposing players and, and teams, but for your own players, if, you, if they felt like they were, you were not giving 100%. But, uh, but I had a great time. I had just over three years there and really enjoyed myself. Yeah, I mean, that was where you... The second most appearances for a club that you had outside of Gillingham, right? Yeah, that's right. And so, so I think I think the biggest part of that was, as I said, I joined at twenty two, and that was my first club that I joined, where I, you know, it's, it's, it's men's soccer. I had to really, you know, I'd had a couple of loan spells before, but this was my real chance to go somewhere somewhere away from Arsenal. And you realise that Arsenal is, if you like, the pinnacle. That's the the best of the best. You get everything there. Then went to Millwall and you had to fight. We had to fight. I had to fight for everything, and uh, I learned an awful lot there. Um, managed to obviously, you know, stay there for for three years before moving on to Gillingham, which is which was not obviously a, a club that was not far away anyway. But um, but it was it was a good learning curve for me. So it's Gillingham, not Gillingham. Yes, gotcha. That's right. It's, it's, it's so, those little subtleties. Yeah, you know? I know. There's a, that's the English language for you. You know, there's yeah. lots of different you know, ways. But uh, I'd like to think I'd like to think I know them, and then I and I end up getting them wrong. Yeah, so that's cool. goes goes to show you. Anyways, uh, so you spent a, a number of years over in England playing yes. in different levels of the league, and then in 2011, you make the move to New York yep. for one of the uh, the newer teams in the USL Pro, as mm-hmm. it was called then, uh, FC New York, which ended up only lasting one year, but. First off, what spurned the decision to come over to the States? And how was that first year with uh, FC New York? I think a couple of ways. I mean, uh, through contacts, through some people that I knew with um, Sheffield United, actually, um, who knew the owners of the start, starting up the club in, in, in New York. And just my desire to then, at that point, I think I was 36 or around that time, and um, wanting to... Wanted to start obviously getting into coaching. I'd done my uh, UA for B license, and I wanted to get into coaching. And, and in the U, in in England at the time, or still the same now, very difficult to get coaching jobs. It doesn't matter how long you played for, doesn't matter what your licensing is. It's tough to get coaching jobs. So I was wanting to obviously get into coaching, um, which was difficult at the time. And so FC New York gave me the opportunity to still play. I was when I went over there initially as a player, player coach, but be assistant um, out to the team. So in the USL, so that gave me an opportunity. Um, obviously, went over there, um, but to be honest, I think unfortunately it, it became apparent very quickly that 
the club didn't really have the resources or the structure to be able to continue. Um, we got through the year. Within a couple of months, the coach left and I took over the team um, for the rest of that year. It was actually a, a great experience. Um, it was it was very, very good for me, but um, it became apparent that, that, you know, the club was going to struggle to continue. Um, so obviously, unfortunately, that, that ended pretty quickly. But, uh, but I, had, I had a good time and, and learned an awful lot. Yeah, and then basically right from there, you ended up in, in Orlando, right? Um, I think it was May of 2012, mm -hmm. you, you were announced as the uh, director of the Youth Academy for Orlando City. Correct. So, I mean, how did that come about? So that came about, very interestingly, I, if you wind back again, maybe maybe nearly 20 years ago, I played at, in, <clears throat> at Burnley with Adrian Heath. Mm -hmm. um, and I say I, I played, we didn't actually play together. I actually, I think, came in to replace him. He was injured mm. at the time. I was at Arsenal, I think, as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old maybe. Um, and Burnley brought me in to replace Adrian, who was injured at the time. So I went to Burnley for three months, I think two or three months. Um, and obviously, we got, got to know each other. Um, and... Uh, and then wind that on 15, 20 years. And, you know, obviously he was in Orlando. I was in New York and uh, we played against each other a couple of times when I was at FC New York, um, got chatting. And uh, and luckily, all the, the timing sort of all worked out, that um, the timing of when FC New York were, were folding. And obviously they were starting the academy here. They obviously had big plans at Orlando City as far as what they wanted to do. And, you know, Adrian just contacted me and asked if I was be interested in coming down. So we were actually, as a family, we were actually planning to go back to the UK, you know, go back there and obviously just um, and just try and get jobs there. So it worked out perfectly, timing-wise. Um, it came came down to Orlando and uh, and obviously started, started the position that you mentioned. And uh, and so I'm, I'm extremely grateful to him, really, because I was... Obviously, as I said, I was, we were planning as a family to go back to the UK um, and, and, and obviously try and get jobs there. So um, it, it worked out perfectly. And you've, you've fully planted your roots now in Orlando, being here since 2012. Um, you, you've held a, a number of different roles within Orlando City now to this point. You started off as the, uh, the Youth Academy director and kind of yeah. done other things. You were the U23 coach for a while. Now you've moved into broadcasting and... Uh, I mean, do you do you have a favorite memory of, of any of these that, that that kind of like stands out to you as as like, you know, this is this is why I chose this. Like, this is this kind of reinforces that decision at all. No, I mean, I think you know, still still being involved with Orlando City Youth um, is is a, is is great because I, I just enjoy it. I enjoy watching players develop. I mean, I mean we have a perfect example now with. Um, in Orlando City, when you have certain players like Santiago Patino, I was the under-18 coach when he was there with Benji, Michelle, with Mason, um, with um, uh, then you have like Jordan Bender. You know, he was with us at 12, 13 years old, and you see him develop. And so, and there's numerous other players out out in college. Um, so that gives you that gives you an awful a, a great sense of. Um, of reward if you like for the work that you've done and just putting the stru structure in place and letting, letting these kids develop and watching them develop so I think that's the most rewarding part of it um, as you mentioned you know I think being part of Orlando City, City and seeing it develop um, at that time I needed to take a lot of different roles on, on. and then being part of the under 23s was great while well, that was going going ahead um, and to, but to be honest, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this the other day. I've coached boys and girls from six, five, six, seven, all the way to, as you mentioned, the under 23s and loved every minute of it. And so the club have given me a great opportunity to be part of the youth structure, part of obviously just the club in general. Now, obviously, as you said, moving into the broadcasting as well is, an, is another part of um, just learning, you know, again, Doing the broadcasting and it gets you out of your comfort zone. That's for sure. It's um, it's 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 not easy being on live TV at times, but 
at the end of the day, you're talking about soccer, you know, and so so I love it, you know, and so I'm I'm just grateful for the the opportunities I've had, and um, just continue to have, you know, I, I just enjoy every part of of the club, to be honest. So now, quickly talk about the the U23 team um, and kind of how it's evolved, I guess yeah. you could say. Uh, it stopped in 2016 when OCB came along. Um, and now OCB has, has reemerged with the Montford Academy partnership and, and yeah. uh, everything going on over there. Um, how, is it, how has it been kind of uh, working with, with Montford and, and kind of shifting gears to, to their focus and everything? And then do you feel like Orlando kind of missed the U23 teams a bit when there was OCB going on and, and you know, because OCB is, is a professional level mm. and then the U23s was like a PDL for college kids. So it yeah. was it was an opportunity for uh, for kids that are tied to Orlando that are still in college to be a part of the club still, um, but not necessarily having to commit to being a professional. So yeah. uh, just your thoughts on the, the U23 team and then and Montford. I think, I think the... Um, the... <clears throat> The, the U23 team at the time was the perfect structure. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no USL team, if you like. We had well, we had the USL team, but that was the the, the main team. Um, and I think there was always that plan of hopefully, obviously, the club would move into MLS, then have a USL team along along the way. I just think it is very very difficult for the club to have um, obviously the MLS have the usl then have the u23s as well as having the pride and so that so that becomes very very difficult to have that whole structure um you know the club's done a really good job as well with having the, the structure that's in place but not you know having the u23s as well is going to be difficult ideally it would be great of course because like as you mentioned it, it gives those college players in the middle of their seasons the opportunity to to come and play somewhere and it gives you the opportunity to monitor them and and obviously identify other players as well. So there is a place for it, that's for sure. Um, you know, I think the, the fact that Montverde have taken the USL team and it's it's in in a way completely different now. It's obviously really connected to the academy. the The average age of the team is really really young. You know, and so I think that that is really uh, the, their main focus now. And it should be, you know. So I, I it's, you know, I think so that that works well. I just don't think it's it, it's going to be it's be very difficult for the club to have a have a PDL team as well. Right. Right. So now, how how closely are you working with with Montverde now that they've kind of you know supplanted a, the Orlando City Academy, if you will, uh, and they've taken the reins on that? And then, uh, what do you make of Montverde to this point? Yeah, I work very closely with them. Um, firstly, with with two people really is with Mike Patempa, um, Tony Hernandez, who's the director of methodology. I think his title over there. Um, I work really closely with them on on obviously players really the whole time. So they've been very very good as far as um, uh, identifying players through Orlando City Youth. Can, can all, always being in touch with me about, about what players are doing well, what players should be given the opportunity in the DA. That's a path that we've always created for the last six, seven years, and it's still there, which is really, really important because the Orlando City youth players, if they get to a certain level, we will move them onto the DA because that's the highest level for them. On the flip side to that, if there's any players there that in the DA that are, are, are not quite at the level and need more game time and things like that, then they move them down to us and they play easier now with us. So it works very well. Um, obviously, it's very different to how the structure's always been because the the DA has always been right next to where Orlando City Youth is, so it's always been very, very easy. Um, now it's obviously slightly different for it being you know a bit further away, but the structure's still there, the relationship's still there. Um, it works well, I get on with, uh, really well with them. Um, you know, there's no denying it's, it's very different to an academy I've ever um, obviously been brought up with. You know, I've always been brought up with an academy that was at the same site as, as your first team, the whole structure all together. Um, but I just don't think, uh, obviously, the owners felt that that was, that was possible at this, at this moment. There is no doubt Montverde has got fantastic facilities. The coaches do a really good job there. Um, so it made sense, you know, and I think it made sense for everybody at that time. So 
what will happen in the future, who knows? Um, you know, I just I, I don't think you can be having an academy, USL team, a MLS team all on the same site. You know, the the, the, the amount that I learned just through being a 16, 17 year old at Arsenal, when you're walk, walking along the corridors and there's first team players there and you're on the field next to them training, I learned so much from that. So you can't beat that. Um, you know, hopefully one day we'll, we'll get to that here. Yeah, it's it, in an ideal world. That's that's what we would hope. Yeah. Right. So now speaking of, of youth, and this is a good segue into where we are sitting right now. Um, you, you've taken on this, this other project here, uh, which is uh, Viram Academy. So it, it is a very unique style of school, and it is, it is in, in, in essence, a school. Uh, fairly new school, but with a very uh, European kind of idea behind it. Uh, just, just explain uh, what, what it's all about and, and why it's just such a unique uh, project. I think it's unique because um, what, we, what we have here is, is 20, 20 kids, um, 20 boys um, that are all at a good level, um, either in Orlando City DA, other DAs or ECNL pro, um, programs, um, all around about 13, 14 years of age, 12, 13, 14 years of age. Um, and what they do is they, they, they come here in the mornings um, and we, have, we do soccer activities from 8 to 11. That's maybe an hour, hour and 15 minutes on the field. Then we'll do yoga, we'll do film with them, speed and agility. Um, we have so many different uh, things that we can do with them at that time. Um, 11 o'clock, they go off, they have their lunch, um, still on site, they have their lunch, they have free time there. Um, and then in the in the afternoons from 12 to 4, they do their studies, and it's all on the, uh, the same site. Um, what I, I think is really unique about it is we can give them a real focus um, five days a week on their soccer. Um, we're not rushed through it, anything. Um, we don't have, um, I find it interesting, we don't have other people waiting to go after us on the fields and things like this. We're, we can do it and we can really go through their, their development with those players. We're very, um, we're club neutral, so we want to aid what they do with their clubs. That's really important. Um, I monitor their loads, their training loads, really closely. Um, so their training with us will be designed based on their, their loads with their clubs um, and upcoming games, games that they played training sessions that they have with their clubs. So we really monitor their load, loads. We have some incredible coaches that come in and work with the kids as well. Luke Bowden, Gio Alvarez, um, who Orlando City supporters will know as well, that have got great backgrounds. So uh, uh, among other very good coaches as well. So we, we, we really monitor them and give them, we want to give, give them the best opportunities to be the highest level of college players, if not pros. Um, that's our, our mission. That's what we want to do, um, and, and we and we do it here. And so, so we we're, we're not here just to uh, take the players off the parents um, or the kids off the parents for for a day and just put them into some soccer activities. We're here to really develop them, and we can do it. That's what I really like about the, the project. We can do it, as I said, five days a week, and we don't have to rush through it. You know, so it, it's 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 a great um, project. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the the working in tandem with their youth clubs or, or you know their uh, their other clubs that they have in the afternoons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how how imperative is it, it to have that relationship with the other clubs and and to be able to kind of sell them on on this idea of of being able to to let their players you know go to a, a soccer school where they train in the mornings and then have enough. Uh, you know, energy and ability to train fully with them in the afternoon. Well, I think it's really important. We've had every club in here to watch what we do and 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 for us to explain what we do. So that's from Montverde have been in uh, to obviously every other youth club that these these young men are are, are connected with. So um, and I think once they once they come in and they understand what we do. Um, I have a board which um, I've shown you, Austin, that where I go through with the players, their training loads. Um, I have this, I, I don't like them to do more than 13 hours per week of soccer activity. 
um, because I believe that all the research I've done and looked up, I think that's an optimal amount for them to do. Um, that's with the soccer here at Virum and obviously what they do, what they do with their clubs. So as I said, we're here to aid what they do with their clubs, not to take over, not for them to go to their clubs and be tired. That's why I stress with the players and the parents that I need to know their schedules for training and for games so that I can tailor the training here um, around that. So we are we are helping them to develop into into obviously top top class athletes and, 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 and men. You know, that's the most important part because we know here their academics are super important as well. You know, we I work really closely with the principal here that um, if they're not on pace with their academics, they don't do soccer. You know, we want to make sure that they're they're rounded, uh, well-rounded young men, and they do their academics as well as their soccer. Yeah, and I've met with the, the teachers as well as, and you know, they they say you know, if they get a certain grade uh, that allows them to play soccer, and it's you know just yep. barely above, uh, the teachers will say, well, you can do better than that. Yep. And they push the players not only you know academically in the classroom, but then you have the coaches out there pushing them. Uh, you know, skills and, and soccer-wise. So it, it, it is a very unique kind of balance, especially for here in the States, because, well, there really isn't a school like this. No, and, and, and that's the thing, and, and, and that's what we like about it as well, that we have 20 students. Um, you know, that, that number, number may grow as we grow. This is our first year. Um, but we still want to focus on exactly the, the same core values of making sure that these players are... Um, are focused obviously on their on their soccer, but equally, if not m more, on their academics. Because as we know, ninety percent of these players, 95, 90, 99 percent probably are going to go go into college. We want them to go into college and and play soccer. Well, you can't play soccer in college unless you have the grades. So they need to focus on those grades, um, probably more than their soccer. Um, we work really hard on making sure that we give them everything that we can give them on the field. Um, and then, the, the, as you mentioned, we're, we're aiding what, what they do with their clubs uh, and uh, you know, ho hopefully continue to develop them as players and they can get better and better. Well, we, we could spend a lot more time talking, but uh, I know we, we both have places to be. So uh, I'll let you go here. Paul, thank you very much for, for joining us here. And uh, we'll see you on the broadcast on Sunday. Thank you, Austin. Cheers. All right. And that was our interview with Paul Shaw, talking a, a little bit about everything. Uh, just a, a really interesting interview. You know, tried to cover as many topics as, as we possibly could. And, uh, you know, Paul's a great guy, uh, you know, in front of the, the broadcast booth as well as just, you know, as a person. So uh, big thanks to him. All right. So. Uh, let's go ahead and finish up the show. Uh, let's finish up the show here with our normal stuff, as as we usually do, our red cards, predictions, and weird news. Uh, Gavin, I, I understand you have some good weird news. I do have some good weird news. This comes from us from the uh, folks down south in Australia. It is a 56-year-old David Hinks. He's a former employee at a construction engineering company. He is suing his firm for bullying in 2017, accusing his supervisor, Greg Short, who uh, he's referred to as Mr. Stinky, um, as the, the defendant in this case, of being a serial offender who regularly th thrusted his bum at him. Um, he's seeking damages for $1.28 million. Oh, dear. Yeah. Not great. Uh, okay, so last week, I believe I brought you a story about one of the um, college soccer players that was not a soccer player. Yes. You remember that? Uh, more yeah. of, of not necessarily the same exact college admission scandal, but uh, it's kind of in the same ballpark. So Dr. Dre attempted to throw shade on the, recently, uh, the recent celebrity college admission scandals. He posted a, a caption with his daughter. My daughter got accepted into USC all on her own. No jail time. And then quickly deleted it after it was uh, pointed out about how in 2013 he and Beats by Dre co-founder Jimmy Levine uh, donated $70 million to USC uh, to establish the Jimmy Levine and Andre Young Academy for Arts, Technology, and the Business of Innovation. Hmm. 
So, I mean, she may have gotten it on our, all on her own, but also she's Dr. Dre's daughter who donated $70 million to the school to start an academy for arts, technology, and business of innovation. So, maybe not. Yeah, like, yeah, she got accepted, but also you may have inadvertently paid $70 million yeah, for pretty, that to happen. Pretty much. Um, and then there's also a, a weird news. It's not real news. It's it's kind of like real fake news. Uh, but it was funny and re- relevant, and we figured we should probably just mention it. Uh, this is from the Nutmeg News. It's basically the onion for soccer. Um, and here's here's the title of the article. Man still convinced he is going to make money via soccer podcasting and blogging. Um, I'm triggered. Yeah, first of all. So, a uh, little bit inside baseball. I mean, we do think we're going to make money off this because we're very wealthy and we have millions of subscribers. So please, <laughs> please um, <laughs> sponsor our podcast. Uh, I mean, we're just dripping in corporate dollars over here. So single dollar, a dollar. I found on the ground outside of Orlando City Stadium. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so here, uh, it could still happen, uh, says uh, Rich Breston of New Jersey. Uh, do, 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 do. I just need more time, really some more time in between my job and atten- uh, my attending a soccer game on the weekend, watching five MLS games, five USL games, and five NASL games to try and find the time to write a preview on the NWSL season, covering the U.S. men's national team and staying up to date with the U.S. women's national team and trying to find out what's going on with the MP- MPSL. I got this. I got this. I've achieved <laughs> nearly everything I want from my career. I have over 5,000 followers on Twitter. I've been published internationally in The Guardian, The Telegraph, and 442. I've talked with players, owners, league commissioners, and international superstars that people in England can't even get for one-on-one interviews. My blog has gotten over a million hits in its lifetime. And people recognize me when I go to certain stadiums. The only thing that hasn't <laughs> happened is actually making a livable wage. I mean, despite dedicating my 15 years of my end to the grind, I am actually still doing all of this as my second job while I process new hires as a human resource assistant. I still believe, though. I mean, somehow, some way, maybe going to figure out. Oh, never mind. I'm shutting everything down. <laughs> I, that really, that really just like. I mean, same. Yeah. <laughs> That hurts a little. I know yeah. it's satire and everything, but also like that's kind of too real. Yeah. Um <laughs> kind of <laughs> definitely feel that whole putting in forty hours a week and also working forty hours a week on a real job. It's close to home. Yeah. Yeah. At least I'm getting paid for some of the stuff that I do. <laughs> Cause I've I've kind of just gone away like I'm doing a lot more broadcasting stuff, which actually pays. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least you got that. At least I got that going for me. Yeah, I've already done my red card. Do you have one? Uh, my red card goes to this guy. Um, so as you know, I've been watching the show inadvertent, you know, non voluntarily. It's called uh, Temptation Island. Non voluntarily now, huh? Non voluntarily. Uh-huh. So and I didn't yet, want what, to, hold, on, I, hold on, hold on, hold on. What are you doing right now? N- not watching it. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Um, definitely not watching it on my phone with a headphone connected to it, um, on Hulu. <laughs> um, so as, as some of you may know, I watch a lot of a uh, law and order SVU and it's on USA all the time. And these commercials for the show came out a while ago and it just looked like the worst show ever. And eventually my fiance started watching it just because she gets, she also hated it. But at the same time, it was like, I'm kind of interested. So then she started watching it and it got me into it. And there's this one couple on there. This one guy, just a real, real mean guy. Not like a mean guy, but like they went in there and he did not stay faithful. And he, I, I can't even explain it. He, he broke this girl's heart and she was such a nice girl. And he found love somewhere else and it was just devastating. So I give him a red card for being unfaithful. Okay. <laughs> but, that was a long walk to get to nowhere, but yeah, no, there it is. I mean that's that's <laughs> typically a red card for you. Yeah. All right, that's very typical. Last thing, we'll predict the Orlando City game. 
I didn't put any. I didn't write out anything else. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Long list of things I'm disappointed at you with. <sighs> Let's see. Orlando City. We talked about the game a little bit earlier. Ugh. Pick something. <laughs> draw. I'm going to go confidence with a draw. <laughs> I think that's... I don't want to keep saying, like, oh, it's best case scenario, but, like... I mean, it's really just the safest bet. Because, I mean, we're talking about a DC team that, like I mentioned, has not given up a goal this year. So to expect Orlando to just drop three on them and also not give up a few goals at the very least is going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I'm going to also go draw. I think they will score the first goal for anyone against DC United, but I don't think they keep a clean sheet like they did last time. Yeah. Again, it's all depending on the matchups, right? It depends on how Orlando and how uh, DC match up against each other, what formations they end up trying to play against each other. Because what, DC, when they beat RSL 5 uh they ran a 4-2-3-1. Um, I think they typically do, yeah. That yeah. sounds about right. So, you know, if Orlando run that 3-5-2, that might give some issues just kind of pushing numbers forward against the back line, which is only a four man back line. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you have those two separate midfielders defensively with Moreno and, and Canales usually. Um, but I think, I think they could provide some problems against a, uh, a team that, I mean, again, you look at the lineup that Real Salt Lake put out and they were running a four, two, three, one, two. So it was like a like for like kind of matchup. And those usually either don't well they they usually don't end well for one of those teams yeah i mean i think if they kind of if they are able to press dc back as much as they can and kind of avoid the mistakes like they did or you know like they couldn't do against montreal they'll have a chance to win i'm not sold on this team being able to consistently uh win games and lock them into the playoffs right now but i think they have they're they're figuring out who they are and i think they're kind of understanding what they need to do on a weekly basis and if they can be consistent at that they have a good shot i mean orlando's not a team that's going to play pretty soccer they don't have uh hey 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 you don't know that i've been watching this team for five years and i very rarely see them play pretty soccer (laughs) They they just play they don't like they don't play pretty soccer they play at times ugly they play at times lucky they play at times looking for a bounce to go in their direction and that's kind of where this game is gonna have to fall they're just gonna have to have a couple bounces I think go the right way and if they hold together defensively they have a really good shot just put yourself in a good position to win the game and then let your yeah. players take the rest of it yeah right so. That's going to be it for us here on the Orlando Soccer Show. Yeah, we'll be we'll be back next week. That that's it. We'll yeah. be back at the stadium, Mike Ramajo and I, hopefully. So, look looking forward to that. Follow Gavin Eubank at Gavin Eubank. Follow me at Austin David Twenty Two. Both of those usernames are on Twitter. I don't and know. On, do you do you want on Instagram? Yeah. Do you, I was going to say, do you want to plug your Instagram? Gavin Eubank on Instagram. Yeah, I'm Austin David Two on Instagram because someone took oh. Austin David Twenty Two. <laughs> See, you settled. For just two, yeah. You, you know what's weird? There's another Austin David that's more like famous. Oh, really? He's a singer from like L.A. <laughs> yeah, weird. Hmm. Do you ever get mistaken for him? No, never. No, no. I just looked. No. I, I was like googling. I was trying to find a tweet that I sent out a while back, so I googled Austin David, and then I was looking for the tweet, and it popped up Austin David, and it was like verified. I'm like, what? That's why I couldn't ha- get Austin David as a Twitter name. Damn. That makes sense. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> All right, that's yeah. the end of the show. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Bye.